Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth annual Port of Wainimi World Trade Week Conference, a virtual event for the first time this year. The Port of Wainimi is a World Trade Center licensee, and in concert with a strong team of stakeholders, is hosting an event, this event as part of our overall initiative to advance the business of Ventura County and expand their reach into the global marketplace. The focus of this year will be on challenges and opportunities offered by our post-pandemic world. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce Kristen Dikus, CEO and Director of Port Wainimi, for a call to order and opening remarks, followed by a welcoming message from Jason, <coughs> excuse me, Jason T. Hodge, President of the Oxnard Harbor District. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first ever virtual World Trade Center event. And perhaps, God willing, this will be our last um, as we're all finding our way out of this uh, last year of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, but we are excited to be here with you today and we have a really exciting lineup. First, we wanna extend our gratitude to our customers, our community, our trade partners, the stakeholders uh, in our business and, and hats off to them as we've really shown how resilient we are um, in the face of hardship and, and really stood up as an industry and saw trade particularly here at Port of Wanimi grow, and, and it's a testament of the good work of our partners that made that happen. Many thanks to our trade consuls who have put together some fine videos for you all to enjoy that really celebrate the good workings of what's happening in their countries around trade and commerce. And again, a testament to the resilience that they've shown in their nations in the face of COVID-19. We do have a great lineup here for you today. Our keynote speaker is Marianne Roden, and she's the founder of Trade Nerd. And she's gonna to talk to us all about her insights in trade and commerce. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from our very own Ray Bowman with the Small Business Development Centers of Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. And with him will be Lukesh Dani of Axopolis, and he's the founder of that organization. And they've done some research on careers in international trade, and they have some exciting news to update us on that front. And then in closing, I would just really like to thank my team, my staff for all the hard work that they put into this and the partners with the Department of Commerce, the District Export Council of Southern California, uh, Small Business Development Centers, and the Economic Development Collaborative. Without their hard work, we wouldn't be able to be here today having this virtual um, event, which I think is gonna be pretty uh, fascinating to learn what's going on in global trade. It's very interesting times and there's a lot to share. Thank you for being with us and uh, we look forward to working with you going forward. I'm Jason Hodge, President of the Port of Wainimi. The Port of Wainimi welcomes you to our ninth annual World Trade Week event. As we emerge from the global pandemic, we reflect on the lessons learned and look to the future as we navigate together this post-COVID world. More than ever, international trade is critically important for our port, our region, and our country. Our port customers, labor, and partners have worked amazingly hard to keep cargo moving. They have also worked tirelessly to help ensure goods and services are arriving to our local communities during these times of need. We will learn from these experiences and grow stronger from all the new connections we have made. During this acknowledgement of World Trade Week, we deeply appreciate the people who make it happen and the incredible resilience of our county, our country, and our industry. So on behalf of the Port of Wainimi, I want to thank you for participating. I would now like to introduce Donna Lacayo, Chief Commercial and Public Affairs Officer of the Port of Wainimi, who will introduce the next portion of today's event. Thank you, Catherine. We're thankful to have some wonderful international partners here at the Port of Wainimi. These partners create a valuable two-way trade that helps support the regional economy and the central coast, as well as Ventura County region. They represent um, goods as, var as varied as automobiles, high-tech goods, bananas, agricultural products, and machine products. Through the port annually, we see over 10 billion worth of, car of cargo goods annually. That creates over 15,000 jobs here. We are very grateful for our partners. Some of the top countries that we do business with are South Korea, United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and Mexico. We reached out to them to help celebrate 
World Trade Week today. Many of them were anxious to participate and provided recorded messages to share with you today. Please join us while we listen to the messages sent from our partners in celebration of World Trade Week. We'll hear today from Belgium, Ecuador, Estonia, Korea, Mexico, and Thailand. Thank you, Kat. Good morning, dear guests of the Port of Wenemi. I'm happy to briefly tell you a thing or two about Flanders, the northern region of Belgium. Flanders is situated in the heart of Europe, which makes it an ideal springboard to a consumer market of 450 million people. What we mainly buy from the USA is pharmaceuticals and chemicals, cars and trucks, machinery and plastics, but a whole lot of other products as well, of course. Reach out to me if you want to find out more about what Flanders can mean for your company. And now let's watch a short movie that speaks for itself. Thank you. Are you looking to accelerate your business in the heart of Europe? This is Flanders, where four ports connect you seamlessly to the European hinterland. Only here are the lines between people and transport exceptionally short. We have a natural appetite for excellence. Being at the forefront of safety, traceability, and innovation, we are very serious about food. Led by our solution-driven attitude, we pioneer niches in software, electronics, and advanced manufacturing. Our unique cluster of biotech, nanotech, and healthcare constantly pushes boundaries for life-changing treatments. And as we continue to develop new materials, cleaner resources, and sustainable chemistry, we provide the building blocks for future growth. Whatever your means of transport, Flanders is the smart choice. By offering a perfectly integrated logistics system, our region makes distribution effortless. That's how we are the perfect fit for your business. Flanders, generously efficient. Buenos días a todos. Envío mi cordial saludo y un agradecimiento a las organizaciones, en especial a la CEO y directora del puerto de UNEME, Christine Decas, y a Jason T. Hodge, presidente del distrito de Osnar Harbor. Mi saludo se extiende a importadores, distribuidores, representantes de navieras internacionales, empresas logísticas, centros de distribución y almacenamiento de los Estados Unidos, en esta novena edición de la Semana del Comercio del puerto de UNEM. El encuentro que hoy inicia fortalece las buenas relaciones entre nuestros países. Una relación histórica entre Ecuador y Estados Unidos que se enfrió por mucho tiempo, pero que hoy, gracias a la decisión política, gracias a la nueva visión comercial que tiene el gobierno nacional, ha logrado que el Ecuador se integre a muchos países, que busca una apertura comercial que genere beneficio en inversiones, que atraiga inversiones a nuestro país, pero que también permita que los productos ecuatorianos, que son muchos y que están posicionados alrededor del mundo, tengan una mejor y mayor participación en importantes mercados internacionales, principalmente con Estados Unidos, nuestro principal socio estratégico comercial. Nuestros principales productos de exportación hacia Estados Unidos son muy conocidos y reconocidos y demandados por la exigente clientela americana. ¿Cómo no hablar del camarón, la textura, el sabor, el banano, las flores, el cacao ecuatoriano, entre otros productos, y una diversa canasta de exportación no petrolera que cada día se abre espacio en importantes mercados, como lo he mencionado, principalmente el americano. En ese sentido, hemos buscado consolidar esta relación comercial y hemos trabajado arduamente desde el gobierno nacional, desde el ministerio al cual lidero, buscando este acercamiento y construyendo una alianza estratégica perdurable en el tiempo. Por eso, tener hoy y hablar de un acuerdo de, un, de primera fase que se firmó en diciembre del año anterior entre los dos países, la máxima autoridad del USTR, conjuntamente con el gobierno ecuatoriano, logramos concretar un acuerdo 
que si bien es cierto es un acuerdo inicial, pero es el gran arranque para visualizar una agenda comercial mucho más prometedora para el año 2021. Nos encontramos en una transición histórica, democrática en el Ecuador, ordenada y profesional. Estamos entregando la hoja de ruta muy clara que le permitirá al nuevo gobierno continuar con estos esfuerzos y lo más importante, garantizar que el Ecuador continúe en esa política local e internacional de apertura, de integración y de empuje y de apoyo principalmente a los sectores productivos del sector privado, que son los que generan las fuentes de empleo en el Ecuador. Nueve de cada diez empleos los genera el sector privado. Por eso la importancia de seguir promocionando y posicionando, de buscar aliados estratégicos, logísticos. La logística hoy es fundamental en el comercio internacional. Por eso, en este día, les agradezco participar e invitar. Agradecer a mi oficina comercial. Ecuador tiene tres oficinas comerciales en Estados Unidos, en Los Ángeles, quienes han realizado un trabajo muy exitoso. La pandemia no paralizó, nos obligó a ser dinámicos y adaptarnos a esta nueva realidad. Seguimos promocionando y ubicando la oferta con la demanda, no solo con Estados Unidos, sino con el mundo entero. Hemos realizado muchas ferias virtuales, muchos encuentros B2B entre potenciales compradores y vendedores del país. El Ecuador le dice hoy al mundo, tenemos alimentos que cumplen altísimos protocolos de bioseguridad e inocuidad. Continuaremos en esa dirección, incrementando nuestras exportaciones no petroleras. La pandemia nos ha dejado muchas enseñanzas, pero también muchos desafíos. Gracias y buena suerte a todos. Sembramos futuro. Nice to meet you. My name is Song Soo Soon. I am a Korean consul in Los Angeles. I'm in charge of uh, economic issues and trade issues. Thank you for giving me this chance to introduce Korea. Uh, as you know, Korea is a trade-oriented country. We have many uh, trade supporting policies such as uh, free trade zones and uh, many incentives for foreign uh, direct investors and also Korea and the United States have a uh, FTA uh, since 2012 uh, last year uh, because of the pandemic many countries uh, have a hard time in trade situations. However, Korean government uh, COVID-19 quarantine policies were relatively successful. So we, we have very small damages in trade. Uh, Korean uh, GDP growth rate in uh, last year was uh, nearly zero percent. Uh, it was the it was uh, uh, very high level among OECD countries. So uh, I think Korea is very uh, good trade partner of the United States uh, now. And the uh, Korean consulate. Uh, is uh, uh, helping uh, 
trade between Korea and the United States. So, if you have any question or uh, want help from our consulate, please uh, contact me. I can uh, support uh, you with uh, many consultants uh, with uh, related to uh, logistics, uh, legal matter, customs matter, uh, and so on in Korea. Thank you. Greetings from the Consulate of Mexico in Oxnard. It is a pleasure to participate in the 9th Annual World Trade Week. I would like to express our gratitude to the Port of Wainini and all the organizations that make this event possible. There are many factors that make Mexico one of the best choices for locating business operations. In the years to come, the country will continue to make progress on a range of fronts, including infrastructure, legal certainty, deregulation and security, among others, in order to further improve the business environment. The path taken thus far and the goals set by the Mexican government and society make expectations for the country to emerge as a key economic power by 2040. To further explain all this, here are some highlights of an extended PowerPoint presentation that is available to you at your request. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me with you today. My name is Mangkon Batumgao, Consul General of Thailand in Los Angeles. I would like to congratulate the Port of Waimini on hosting the ninth annual World Trade Week in Southern California, where global trade and international trade between the U.S. and Thailand has been actively promoted. In 2020, Thailand was the air training partner of California, with an increase in imports from Thailand by 12% amounted to 12,000 million U.S. dollars. This year, we hope to expand our bilateral trade with California and the U.S. in the area of food products, furniture and home decor, electronic appliances, and personal protective equipment. In the post-COVID-19 time, Thailand's economy is projected to rebound to 2.5 to 3 percent with the bio circular green economy and the Eastern Economic Corridor at the heart of our economic recovery. As to the EEC, it is a flagship development project located about 60 miles southeast of Bangkok, aiming to transform Thailand into a value-based and innovation-driven economy. The EEC will focus on driving the investment in three emerging industrial clusters, namely digital and emerging technologies, health and well-being, and intellectual logistics. We wish to welcome more business partners in the EEC where investors can enjoy
special privilege of should you need more information about the EEC or Thailand in general, please feel free to contact the Royal Thai Conference in Los Angeles at any time. We are ready to facilitate. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Ray Bowman, Director of the Ventura and Santa Barbara Small Business Development Center to introduce our keynote speaker of the day. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Ray Bowman and it's my pleasure to introduce a dear fan, friend and a fellow trade professional, Marion Rowden as our keynote speaker. Um, Marion is currently the CEO and founder of Trade Nerd LLC. Uh, Marion brings over 20 years experience in international trade and transportation regulatory compliance. Um, she recently completed her tenure at the American Association of Exporters and Importers uh, just this March, having served 12 years as president and CEO, uh, as well as four years as, their, as, as, as the association's general counsel. Um, Marion has testified uh, before Congress many times on trade legislation. Um, her work with the AAEI has played important roles in the development of the Trader's Guide to Post 9-11 and Homeland Security programs, uh, the American Trader's Guide to Advanced Data programs, uh, constructing the Blueprint to Trust, which was a holistic management and a affected trusted traders program, drawback simplification, and many, many more uh, projects that support our nation's uh, importers and exporters. Um, so with all that, I'll turn the program over to uh, Marian. So take it from here, Marian. Thanks so much, Ray, for that kind introduction. And thanks to the port and the Oxnard uh, Harbor District. It's a, it's a great honor to speak with you at the um, this World Trade Week event, as well as uh, the partners that you have assembled, the World Trade Center, U.S. Commercial Service, District Export Council, of course, the C CBDC, uh, California, and Economic Development Collaborative for all important uh, parts of the international trade ecosystem. To celebrate World Trade Week, I thought that it would be useful to take stock at where we are uh, concerning global trade as there is no that doubt that we are at a crossroads right now. So let's go to the next slide and I'll just give you an overview of some of the topics that I'll just touch upon. Uh, we'll talk about trade trends, uh, the great decoupling, which is a, a big issue right now, uh, production shifting, which is happening in the background, and of course, um, uh, the topic uh, that is the basis of uh, this session, uh, COVID, and I call it the great acceleration, and then omni-channel sales and direct shipping. Next slide, please. So by way of background, I thought that uh, to captivate in one slide, uh, global trade trends, uh, the WTO just put out uh, its trade forecast for merchandise trade volume. So this is dated uh, March 31st, 2021. Uh, the graph shows uh, the trend lines from 2011 to 2019, and the actual trade volumes represented by the blue line from 2015 Q1 to 2020 Q4, and the forecast represented by the green and red hash lines. COVID-19 represents an interesting experiment of what happens when the entire world shuts down the global economy for an extended period of time and the impact on different industries. So we've never seen this before. In the United States, we've had trade interruption every two years or so because of, let's say, government shutdown, uh, Fukushima nuclear, uh, incident, Hurricane Sandy, but we've never had the entire global economy shut down all at once. So it's an interesting period in time that we are witnessing right now. And as we'll see in subsequent slides, companies have been forced to be creative and innovate 
So we should see the fruits of those investments in the economy over the next year or so. Next slide. So this is called, I, I call it the great decoupling. And what is meant here is we have the symbiotic relationship between the United States and China. Um, modern China could not have grown without a country like the United States because no other country could have made the direct investments in China, but also absorbed the amount of China's exports. And so the graph that you see is also from the World Trade Organization. And it shows the, um, I'm sorry, it's the US uh, imports from China to the United States. So this is a US uh, trade statistic. So you can see the ups and downs of the relationship uh, in trade, which represents in many ways the ups and downs of our political relationship with China as well. And what I wanted to uh, convey here is a couple of key points. First and foremost, the power of perception. You know, the public has become disillusioned with the benefits of international trade, especially with China. And this has been growing for many years. Um, for those of us who are uh, trade professionals, testifying uh, on trade legislation, advocating free and fair uh, trade policies. It has been a real challenge over the course of my career, particularly the last, I would say five years, because intuitively I think people understand how much trade touches their lives. And the US public perceives that we're paying all of the costs of the international system, trading system, but getting less and less of the benefits. Uh, whether that's accurate or not is, is another story, but it is, shows you the power of um, uh, perception. The other power of perception uh, has been, has translated politically into a bipartisan shift in 2017 on export controls and foreign investment. And this was a real surprise to us in the international trade community because we worked during the Obama administration uh, in the entire eight years. And it was a remarkable achievement to get export control reform done on a regulatory level. And it shows a real commitment by the administration to do that. Um, the export uh, control uh, statute had lapsed for nearly 20 years. So we knew we had to get a new statute uh, because doing things just by regulation was not enough. And it surprised many of us that Congress came together fairly quickly and treated export controls and foreign investment by China in the same uh, legislation, the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. So that was a real surprise and showed a real closing of the ranks politically between uh, various factions within Congress. And it is uh, quite remarkable and there's a couple of reasons I think that led to it. So we've had this change in policy. Uh, certainly we had the section 301 tariffs, which is a hallmark of the Trump administration, um, but they are still there and we'll see how long they stay. Uh, the Biden administration has issued a Buy America executive order and people are really starting to take a look at what are the implications of that executive order. And then we have supply chain legislation in various stages, and this started in the last administration, requiring US supply chain for certain industries to move back to the United States. So that's medical and uh, power supplies and ICTS. And that is really the backdrop of COVID-19. And it exposed so many our, of our vulnerabilities. There's also an issue of technological dominance in the 21st century. Um, computer chips is just one example that many people really focus on. Whoever uh, is the dominant force in manufacturing computer chips will control the technology of the 21st century. So that's a real uh, geopolitical issue, but it's also a trade issue. And then the global financial system, I think very quietly uh, in the background, many of us may have toyed with cryptocurrency, which isn't exactly the precise issue, but we're somewhat aware that 
governments are looking at digital currency. Obviously, a country like India, um, you know, transitioned from paper currency to digital currency over a weekend. So for a very large country, that was quite startling to see. And then, of course, the other issue that we deal with in the tail end in some ways is digital trade. And that's a new and emerging issue. So there's a taxation issue, the digital services tax, which is a battle between the United States and Europe, but also, um, you know, assessing customs duties on digital goods is going to be coming sooner probably rather than later. And we are not prepared for that. Next slide, please. The other aspect that I want to talk about also is in the background, and I think many of you may be seeing it. Certainly uh, the pandemic um, made people uh, reassess, but the idea of production shifting. Now this had started to happen even prior to COVID. Many companies were looking at leaving China as a manufacturing base because costs were rising. In particular, labor costs were rising. The Trump administration's imposition of Section 301 duties further increased the cost of producing in China. But there's some real challenges in moving production out of China. Other Asian and lower uh, cost countries may not have the production capacity of China to serve the US market. Other countries may not have good logistics infrastructure. And here again, India is a, probably a very good example of a large country that could really do uh, manufacture on a large scale, but does have some challenges with infrastructure. Other countries may not have the technical expertise. And here what I mean by that is the engineering class will understand industry and government standards. And that is a very important part of quality control for many companies. And then finally, is moving production back to the United States competitive? You know, there are labor cost issues, there are tax issues. And so you really want to look at what problem could USA production solve for you? Uh, move, moving production closer to raw materials or other inputs. So an example here might be the lumber industry or the furniture industry. You've got a large uh, capacity for the raw material. Perhaps moving production closer to the consumer market. You know, the United States um, it is still a very large consumer market. Reduce pressure on profit margins by avoiding 25% Section 301 tariffs. So that's another big consideration. Increasing quality control over product. And simplifying your manufacturing process. So one of the things that many companies have discovered is that when you produce goods in another country, and then have to ship that finished good to the um, market of consumption, you will uh, get a much more complex supply chain. And complexity has been deadly, uh, particularly during uh, the COVID-19 period. So in September of 2020, uh, BDO did a survey of CFOs from US companies and they issued a 2021 manufacturing CFO outlook. And the companies had revenue between 250 million and 3 billion. So fairly sizable companies. And the basic finding of the survey is that the is that crisis breeds innovation. And the reassuring stats that you see here uh, show where companies will be putting their money. What I found so striking about this survey is how many companies intend to invest in supply chain. So we'll see a lot of innovation in the supply chain over the next couple of years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's our slide of uh, COVID and the great acceleration. And just pause for a minute and let's take a historical perspective. Since the Great Recession in 2008, uh, container freight has not really grown that much, but e-commerce has been growing at about 20% a year. 
the WCO was the first international organization to deal with the practical impacts, what they call the tsunami of packages shipped through express air couriers and postal services. The remit to the World Customs Organization uh, was to form a e-commerce work group uh, for two years to develop a set of framework uh, to set up a guidance document, which eventually became a framework of standards. And I served as the private sector co-chair of that group for three years, and it was a very interesting experience. And the first uh, question, even before I became the co-chair, and I had to really think about for AEI was, why is e-commerce so successful? And all governments support and promote small and medium-sized enterprises to export. And you have to ask, you know, are they successful? Uh, in the US, only about 1% of SMEs export to another country. 81% of the smallest sellers on eBay export to at least five foreign countries. So a lot of this statistical, we weren't picking up the statistics until fairly recently. And eBay would, and most of the platforms do put out reports, public policy reports, and you should read them if you get the chance or, or run across them. But in June, 2012, uh, eBay put out a report called Towards Commerce 3.0, Roadmap for Building Sustainable Growth into uh, Commerce. And it was a very interesting study and that's where I got that statistic from. So if you have these online platforms that are enabling SMEs to export to other countries, you've solved a huge problem. And it took me a long um, time to figure out why that was happening. And um, I think it's because e-commerce is a consumer driven transaction, which is first a transaction between a buyer and a seller and then a, an import and export uh, later. And we have these other features that make e-commerce so successful. One of them is the de minimis. And the United States, for unrelated reasons, raised its de minimis in TIFTIA that was passed in 2015 and took effect in 2016. So our de minimis, and that's on the import side of uh, customs duties, um, uh, formal entries applying. It was previously $200 per shipment per day, and then it went up to 800. So that was a big jump. But Australia had a ha fairly high de minimis as well, and they ended up closing that, that gap. The biggest distinction between the US and the other countries is that the US is the largest country that does not have a value added tax. So we primarily look at customs duties. The other thing that's happening also, and I alluded to it earlier, is we're going through a process of decontainerization. So um, if you think of the top 1,000 importers and exporters, they're mostly more um, multinational corporations, and they import and export 70% of the goods by volume and value. But that's very highly concentrated supply chains in those full containers. What's happening right now is the opposite. You have that direct consumer uh, demand um, and, and it's driving that cargo away from full container loads, although it is happening on the northern border. Then the, the other item to think about is the role of the mail system or the postal services. And I can tell you that many countries, um, their e-commerce system, and here I'm thinking about China, is the postal system. That is their supply chain for e-commerce. And for the United States, that was really a black hole. And uh, Customs was not getting the data. And so now we have the STOP Act that requires that advanced data um, to be sent to CBP. But there's a, another international organization called the Universal Postal Union. And that is one of the first international bodies it's based in Geneva to um, you know, facilitate the um, movement of mail and parcels or packages. And it's in the late 1800s that it was started. So they had to be part of the process and they have to get all the countries um, up to speed on data requirements and that's happening now. Um, 
So it's a huge challenge when you deal with countries, some of whom uh, really rely on the postal service, some of whom um, don't have electricity 24 seven. But this is driving those changes in global trade trends. And we actually had a PowerPoint that I wish I could find that the Universal Postal Union did with IATA. And it just showed the um, number of packages, you know, uh, by airplane cargo. And it was just a swarm of planes coming out of China to the United States and to a less degree the rest of the world. So it's very eye-opening. And once you see this in graphic form, it's it's unforgettable. Next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite slides um, uh, for the shock value. Um, it's a little out of date. Um, this was done before uh, COVID-19. And, um, you know, traditional retail started taking hits early in 2016 when Sports Authority announced its bankruptcy and closed all 460 stores, liquidated all its assets within months, a number of additional retailers delivered uh, disappointing in-store sales. The following stores have suffered a, a, as a result of the move to online retail, announcing a number of store closures. And the slide includes in the big, two biggest and most recent closure, Payless uh, shoes, uh, Source Shoes, Shoe Source, and Sears. Prior to COVID, retailers were primarily concerned with omni-channel sales due to consumer demand. Uh, Post-COVID, all businesses need omni-channel sales, right? Because the foot traffic just stopped. So the question then is now, we're in this odd period, is e-commerce driving the bus, the trade bus? And I saw the numbers um, accelerating or, or growing, but, <clears throat> you know, COVID-19 really accelerated it so that the e-commerce shipments under what's called type 86 entries has now outnumbered the type one consumption entries um, according to CBP. And that happened in July of 2020. So the shift started before COVID-19 and accelerated when the lockdown continued beyond that initial 15 days. So when we would have a government sh uh, shutdown or some kind of trade incident, I could tell you that the United States could only go through about 18 to 20 days of that trade interruption before real problems started, meaning, you know, uh, car manufacturers weren't getting the parts uh, for just in time, uh, manufacturing and a lot of other hiccups in our supply chain. So I knew that there was always this vulnerability and I never envisioned something like a global pandemic with a worldwide shutdown to really drive the point home that how vulnerable supply chains are. Now, ironically, the e-commerce supply chain was the only distribution network that was able to sustain that extended lockdown. And e-commerce with the, um, you know, the de minimis, like I said, the type 86 entries are now exceeding those traditional consumption entries, the type one entries. And now the challenge we have is we almost have like two separate trading systems, a formal customs entry system typified by the type one, ent uh, one entries and an informal entry process, the postal service direct to consumer shipments, the type 86 entries. Now, one of the things that we're forgetting in the United States um, that is getting lost in the discussion is e-commerce really is an export platform. And so, you know, we really need to embrace that again. And, and I'm gonna try to help companies um, really export through the e-commerce platforms. On the import side, the e-commerce um, really does flip the script. Who causes the importation? Who's the importer of record? Who is the buyer? Who is the exporter or foreign shipper? Who is the seller? What is the role and responsibility of the platform? Can any of these parties be really responsible for compliance, customs duties, VAT, 
marking OGA licensing and permits. How does e-commerce affect security and safety? You know, you've got risk that is diffuse and shipment patterns that are less predictable than traditional uh, container freights. And so e-commerce does not fit the traditional um, regulatory regime for customs and even export controls. And I think that's why you see government agencies really struggling. Next slide, please. So here we get to uh, the penultimate question of uh, globalization 2.0. What does it look like? Obviously, you know, I own a little bit of Berkshire Hathaway Class B, not Class A. And one of the things that struck me um, about Warren Buffett was quoted as saying, he had the opportunity to invest in Amazon very early and he didn't. And he said the reason he didn't invest in Amazon is he didn't think Jeff Bezos could switch consumer behavior to an online environment. Well, he did. And the pandemic has solidified that. I don't think we're going back. So I've always ordered my groceries online, you know? And once you do it, you never go back. So long as the quality and the delivery experience is good, people will, will do it. Um, so consumer demand for more products and deliver faster is what is going to keep driving this innovation. And more of the supply chain will be managed by machines, okay? That's happening very quickly. And that's why the e-commerce platforms are having such a big impact, I think, on those of us who've dealt with traditional trade, because we have, you know, not only blockchain, and it's not going to be the end all and be all of uh, everything, but it will be an important tool. You have machine learning, image and optical scanning, which will be important for quality control, robotics, you know, anybody who's in the warehousing business, there are, you know, warehouses that will have no people. Uh, we have them in Japan, there's a couple in China, JD had one built. Um, and I think you're gonna see a lot more of that. Drones, you know, that's another big thing that hasn't really got going yet, but as you see on the right side of the screen, uh, the map shows you how the progress is a patchwork in the United States, but it's progressing. Um, rapid process automation, and if you don't know what this is, don't feel inadequate. I had no idea what it was until a couple months ago. But it's these companies that are now going public like UiPath that are taking business processes in, scraping that data and just automating it in a way that combines with machine learning from past transactions and then artificial intelligence in the future. So it's the combination of technologies that I think is going to make this period very interesting. And then of course, in artificial intelligence, and then you couple that with the internet of things. So I go back to an earlier slide, who's gonna make the microchips for all of that computing power? That is gonna be the dominant force in the 21st century and will drive globalization 2.0. So, you know, one of the things that I think for this audience is important, you hear about all these issues and you say, yeah, but I'm a small guy. You know, this is what the big guys are doing. How does it relate to me? And I think you'll see now that we've got a basically a cloud-based economy that a lot of these systems and innovations will come to SMEs much quicker than in the past because you have that cloud infrastructure and you have those platforms that will be available to you for a subscription. So the current global trading system under the World Trade Organization and the free trade agreements are not, yeah, they're free trade, but they're sort of managed trade, okay? Whereby tax policy and trade negotiations on rules of origin have the biggest impact on where products are made. I don't know that that's gonna be true as much anymore. It'll still matter, but it's not gonna be as dominant as it once was. Um, and so that's why we sort of have a, you know, these two trading systems side by side. And a, and a big issue that will happen this year is the World Trade Organization is negotiating an e-commerce uh, treaty. 
So we'll be following that very closely because hopefully that'll close a lot of the gaps between the formal trading system, the multilateral system, and the de minimis e-commerce trading system. Um, but we'll be having to manage this complexity behind the scenes. And for the next three to five years, uh, the question I asked everybody, first and foremost, as e-commerce tra change international trade? And the answer is yes. And the second question is, will uh, e-commerce change trade compliance? And what we do also as business people, reducing that complexity or managing it. And I think the answer is definitely yes. So with that, you know, we can go to the next slide and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Marianne. I have a few questions from the audience for you. Can you hear me okay? Definitely. Okay, great. The first one is, what are some of the proactive things that small to medium enterprises can, can, can do considering your presentation? I think the biggest challenge here is you know, there's so much information and how do you get reliable information without looking at a bunch of different things? You know, there, any trade professional looks at anywhere from three to five publications every day, everything from the World Trade Organization website to Federal Register. And so I think that's a challenge. Um, I would say if you belong to a local association, like the Foreign Trade Association, which I know is very active, in California, if they put out a newsletter, they will sort of scale and, and put in front of you that which you really need to know. And so I think a source of information is critical. And I'm gonna be working on some tools to help people do that, um, but it is a significant challenge. Thank you. The next question is, who are some of the international trade partners uh, that small to medium-sized businesses should be engaging with to better position themselves for a future for the future of trade who are some of those international trade partners in particular so again i would say uh seek out your local trade associations either in a regional or on a state basis again in california the foreign trade association and when i worked at you know when i was ceo of ai we would try to do a conference with the Foreign Trade Association every other year. Um, there's also in the Midwest, the Midwest Global Trade Association. Um, they, those are very good and I would try to get out there. Of course, I would go to Minneapolis in December when it's freezing and, and, and snowing. But um, the reason I suggest those local organizations is because they're very good at picking through um, what national associations like AEI put out or WTO or even the federal government, and they will sift out and pick out what's relevant for you as a small business operating in, you know, California. But also there's an ecosystem of, you know, local customs, foreign commercial service is very good. Also the Small Business Administration is very keen uh, to keep an eye on uh, international trade. Um, so a few months ago, the Trump administration was going to impose Section 301 duties on um, e-commerce shipments, which would have totally changed the economics of selling on a platform. And it was the SBA that sort of slowed it down a little bit, and we were able to generate some data to show what the big impact would be. So the SBA, if you're not, if you don't have a, a rep that you are dealing with locally, you should really try to find one. Um, also, the Department of Commerce always has good information on, um, they have country desk officers, you know, and they have a little briefs on, um, on foreign countries and uh, the markets. Again, the Foreign Commercial Service has that. So I would start from local and go all the way up. And of course, the other partners that are, um, you know, sponsoring this event and, and your local, you know, port and um, customs reps are, are really good sources. Thank you. 
We have a few more questions coming. I will try to combine one of them into two of them into one question. Uh, you talked uh, a lot about uh, e-commerce and how that's affecting the the usual way consumers were purchasing goods at the stores. Um, how do you see seaports reacting to the growth of e-commerce? And with that, in particular, how will the cold chain of things do you think will be impacting impacted on service delivery? Would more technology need to be used, or how do you see that shift affecting some of that part of the trade supply? Yeah, you know, this is a those are really good questions, and we're sort of in the thick of it now. For the last several years, there's been various digitalization projects of digitizing, you know, the paper because you know our area is very paper intensive. And we've tried to go paperless and it's very fragmented. Also, you have a lot of parties involved, you know, the carriers, the freight forwarders. And um, so there have been fits and starts and there's so many projects that it's even hard to name how many of them. Maersk was behind one of them, for example. IBM has been doing stuff. Um, as far as the seaports, I think what you're going to see is will the e-commerce shipments be consolidated enough to be full container loads so that they can go on ocean. So one of the issues is speed, right? But if consumers do not require it in a hurry, um, you could see that happening by ocean. So let me give you an example of where we are now. Um, the co-chair that I had the last year on the e-commerce work group at the WCO was Mike Leahy of CBSA in Canada. And the reason he was my co-chair is because he was in charge of mail, processing mail for CBSA. Well, when the U.S. increased its de minimis, they were able to um, use Canada as sort of, you know, the logistics hub to supply the U.S. e-commerce industry. So Mike was getting full container loads of e-commerce shipments, and he had to file or process 80,000 manifests for a single 40-foot container. So I think as the numbers grow, you're going to see that on the ocean side. I have no doubt. And what we're going to have to do is deal with the complexity and just the number of discrete transactions, really using all these technologies so that Customs Administration's ports you know, the, the supply chain requires some transparency of who's touched that product, where is it coming from, is it legitimate, is it counterfeit? And I think we're going to have to use the combination of those technologies to really manage all of that so that the hard physical infrastructure of the supply chain, such as the ports, can handle it with, with ease. And I think that'll happen eventually. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Marianne. Just uh, one last question to you to finish off with the questions. Um, with uh, with the acceleration of of traditional compliance needs and documentation done, you you did say that technology will need to be more utilized. How about blockchain? Do you think blockchain will be able to accelerate that trade tra uh, transaction or transition? or maybe replace some of that traditional way of doing documentation? Absolutely, yes. And it's one of the things I'll be working on because blockchain solves a couple of problems. That's not totally unique to international trade, but is a challenge that we have, which is verification of the parties. And it is this distributed, you know, ledger technology. And U.S. Customs in particular has been looking at it. And I think um, there are other countries. What's going to be interesting is I've seen so many uh, pilot projects at the World Customs Organizations or at different conferences. And I'd love to see a clearinghouse of what is everybody doing. Um, the most, the best example that I can give you is <clears throat> um, it had to do with product safety. Uh, there's a gentleman who was at Walmart, he was a vice president. And there was a pilot, and I think IBM did this pilot, and it had to do with the reef call of mangoes, and they did it with the FDA. 
and Walmart was involved. And to do recall traditionally, it took six, six days? No, it took FDA a month, a month or two months. Walmart said, okay, using our traditional methods, it took six days. And I think using blockchain, it took 2.2 seconds. That's the future of globalization 2.0. Now, luckily, uh, that person from Walmart went into the FDA as an assistant commissioner. Um, I don't know if he's still there, but I know the FDA was looking very closely at how to implement um, you know, the, the power of blockchain. And of course, the only big fight that I see happening with like blockchain is it is a distributed, you know, ledger. <clears throat> but who's going to own that data? That is going to be the big fight uh, because the future of trade is about the, you know, the ownership and who controls that data uh, because that's where all the money and the innovation is. So I think you're going to be seeing. Um, an acceleration of pilot projects, but, you know, something where you have uh, enormous, you know, the public health at issue is going to drive that innovation and just the efficiency. Thank you, Ms. Marion Roden. Um, we really appreciate your presentation and the wonderful response to all of the questions. It's very impressive. Thank you very much. With that, I believe I will um, pass it on to Kat. Thank you. Next, we would like to introduce Mr. Gerald Vaughn, Director of the U.S. Commercial Service, U.S. Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration, to provide some comments. Hello, this is Gerald Vaughn. I am the Director of the Local Office of the U.S. Department of Commerce, U.S. Commercial Service International Trade Administration. I wanted to take a moment to introduce the importance of World Trade Week. The World Trade Week concept was conceived in 1926 and first observed in Southern California in 1927. World Trade Week was founded by Stanley T. Olafson then the manager of the World Trade Department of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. By 1935, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had officially proclaimed World Trade Week a national observance by the U.S. government. Initially created to promote the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, World Trade Week expanded its scope following World War II to include all facilities and organizations in the Southern California area involved in world trade. Every May, World Trade Week actively promotes the positive aspects of international trade that are vital to a strong local and national economy. Today's event brings together a great group of partners, and I wanted to thank the Port of Animi, the District Export Council of Southern California, the Economic Development Consortium, the Small Business Development Center, and of course, our export clients. We look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much and have a beautiful day. Next up, we will have an interesting report on research conducted around careers in international trade. We'll have a presentation by Dr. Ray Bowman and Dr. Lokesh Dani. Dr. Bowman has been involved in the operational aspects of international trade and logistics for over 30 years. Currently, Dr. Bowman is the director for the Ventura and Santa Barbara Small Business Development Center, which provides business consulting services for over 500 businesses uh, per year at no cost. Dr. Bowman is held key management positions in some of the world's largest freight and logistic companies and has been involved in consulting and teaching for over 14 years. Dr. Bowman also serves as chair of the Shipping and Logistics Committee for the District Export Council of Southern California by appointment of the US Secretary of Commerce. 
Dr. Lokesh Jani received his PhD in public policy from George Mason University's Char School of Public Policy, of policy and Government. He is the recipient of the dissert, dissertation, uh, dissertation Fellowship Award from the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., and his research has been supported through grants from the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and the National Science Foundation. Dr. Lokesh has co-authored publications in the peer-reviewed journals, uh, journal Small Business Economics and a chapter in the New Oxford's Handbook of Economic Geography. He was the entrepreneurial lead in the National Science Foundation's iCorps program and is the founder of, as, of Exopolis. Our speakers will be available to answer questions after the presentation. Please enter your questions into the questions area of your control panel in the upper right portion of your screen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to the ninth annual Porta Wainimi World Trade Week event. Uh, my name is Ray Bowman. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center for Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. I also head up our international trade technical assistance for the Los Angeles network of small business development centers. Um, and we're hosted by the Economic Development Collaborative of Ventura County. So we're thrilled to be here. Um, I've been involved in trade for over 30 uh, years uh, with a background in logistics and trade finance. Um, I also do research centered around international trade, entrepreneurship, and uh, business support and business growth. And at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, my co-host, Lokesh Danny. Hi, thank you, Ray. And hello, everyone. My name is Lokesh Danny. I'm the CEO of Exopolis. I also have a PhD in public policy from George Mason, where I studied entrepreneurial ecosystems and the future of work. And the research that we are about to show you is actually of very close interest because we get to study the workforce of global trade in the South Central Coast region of California. We have some pretty exciting findings on this point. Uh, with this, I'll hand back to Ray to start the conversation, and then I'll be discussing more in a little bit. Thank you. Great, so to give a little background on the research we did, and uh, first we'll go ahead and share our presentation with you. So the, the research we did was um, uh, funded, supported, and sponsored by the community colleges of California. And the community colleges, what they wanted to learn more about is the impact on international trade in terms of jobs and job creation, and more importantly, how middle skilled jobs could be accessed by students in the community college system uh, to get into working with companies that expand into global markets. So you might say to yourself first, why the interest? Why uh, the community colleges are so interested in international trade. And the best way to describe it is through some of our findings. Um, so if you look at some of the main findings of our research, so what we did was we looked at a comparison between firms that do international trade and firms that don't do international trade. And so um, through uh, some data that we were able to receive through uh, the Port of Wainimi as our partner in this project, we were able to compare trading firms, non-trading firms, and then further investigate what kind of jobs those, those firms were looking for. So what were the differences between um, you know, just a regular firm and then looking at firms that focused on international trade and then what they were looking for in terms of careers and, and job candidates. So part of our highlights of our findings is we found that trade firms outperform non-trade firms. And I'll let Lokesh go into the details of the meaning of that. Um, we also found that global uh, trade jobs reported lower unemployment rates through the pandemic. So global companies were actually more resilient through this pandemic. Um, global trade careers attract talent from diverse occupations. And, and this was no surprise to those of you in trade, but it confirmed something um, that people in the industry have known that 
you know, when you get into global trade, it comes from a diverse set of disciplines and skills. Um, career entrants uh, are experienced in customer service, administrative, and production technologies. So we saw an emphasis on these skill sets within our findings. And we looked at supply and demand. So we were able to look at not only what the firms uh, who participate in global trade were looking for, but we were also able to look at the resumes that were submitted against those, uh, uh, against those openings. So basically we were able to look at supply and demand and realize what the gaps were in that supply and demand. We also found that as much as global trade focuses on physical commodities, things that are shipping all over the world, um, e-commerce is also a big player and a big influencer in, uh, in international trade. And along with that, so are the skills of e-commerce influencing those jobs in international trade. So at this point, I'd like Lokesh to not only go into our findings a little bit, but also talk about a tool uh, that he developed to assist the community colleges and assist the public in general to better understand what these career gaps are and allow students and educators to better understand how to match skills and talents of students with those opportunities within global trade. So at this point, I'd like to hand it back to Lokesh to go a little bit deeper into the study that we did. Thank you, Ray, uh, and thank you for that great summary. And uh, I get the privilege of going deeper down into uh, all the discussions. So Ray has provided an excellent framework, and I'm going to go through each of these points and uh, put some numbers to them, right? And show where our uh, conclusions are actually driving from. So as uh, Ray mentioned, we got our initial data on traders from the bill of ladings uh, from the ports. So we were able to look at businesses that are actually trading goods through the ports, uh, the regional ports, and then we compared them to other types of manufacturers or other firms that fit their similar category, but do not trade internationally. And just looking at the data and comparing uh, over the past few years, we saw that traders uh, are consistently report higher revenue and average sales than non-traders that you see in the dotted blue line in panel A on top. The lower panel B shows that these traders also on average tend to have much higher employment and firm sizes than uh, the non-traders. This is especially true for manufacturers. And this got us really thinking that businesses that trade internationally must have a different profile and completely have a different uh, motivation and workforce that drives them. So we, this is uh, where we started to dig a little deeper into global trade jobs and global trade workers. Now, as you, as you know, COVID and the pandemic had devastating impacts on the economy over the past year. And unemployment rates skyrocketed just within a span of one month. But what we saw when we looked at uh, global trade workers and the global trade workforce in the South Central region was uh, that the unemployment rate also spiked, but spiked a whole four points lower than for the rest of the economy. This, is, this gives us some early evidence that these global trade jobs are quite robust and uh, they are able to hold even a very uh, hold out against a very unexpected and unprecedented pandemic that uh, you know hit suppliers, hit buyers, hit how businesses in, uh, interacted with their customers, and uh, yet global trade was uh, although they were impacted for sure, were able to uh, ride the pandemic a little better than the rest of the economy. This this shows us uh, some idea of how valuable global trade jobs are uh, for our region. But beyond that, global trade jobs and these careers uh, also provide a lot of diverse opportunity for uh, uh, talent and workforce and uh, career movement. So what we did is uh, we also looked at the resumes of people who work in global trade positions. And uh, we looked at over uh, 200,000 resumes in the uh, Los Angeles and South Central region. And uh, we looked at how people have moved across jobs over time and which jobs did they hold or occupations did they hold before entering a global trade career. So here, uh, what you see in the graph chart is just four examples of you know, prominent middle-skill global trade jobs like cargo and freight agents, 
or shipping, receiving, inventory clerks, demonstrators, product promoters, bill and accounts collectors. And the, the nodes that connect to them, the outer circle, shows the jobs or the occupations that workers, common occupations that workers held before they moved into global trade careers. Importantly, you see, they come from really diverse backgrounds. We have even home appliance repairers, cashiers, tellers, to retail salesperson, and um, a billing and posting clerks as well. When we look at the competencies that uh, these workers have brought into when they move into uh, global trade careers, we, say, we see them highly concentrated in customer service applications, uh, administration and accounts management, as well as technical expertise, especially for uh, the production related jobs um, that, that, you know, working on the shipyard or relating to transportation. And, uh, and Lokesh, I, I just also wanted to chime in really quick that what, I, what I'm so impressed with the work that you've done is the only way we were able to do this is we, we examined over 4,700 trading firms and looked at over 30,000 job postings and then the resumes against those postings. So um, one of the things I want to highlight is the fact that you developed an AI technology that actually read each one of these. It was more than keyword searching, but it was actually reading through these resumes so we could pick out those micro skills and pick out um, uh, all of the information from the resumes. So, you know, it's always been a big mystery that, you know, how does someone get to this job, but we're able to really shed light on sort of these career paths that happen naturally and, and the skills associated with them. Yes, th thanks, thanks a lot for that, Ray. Um, and, and that's a great point. So uh, one of the advantages to our approach and our uh, algorithms or technology has been that we are able to pick up a lot of the soft skills and uh, the content that you usually won't get by using um, keyword searches or names of technologies or software. Um, so, and, and uh, I'll be able to show this a lot more, how the magic happens a little bit uh, later when I show you the demo uh, of, of the tool that we built. Um, but, but thanks, Ray, that, that's a really valid point. Yes, we, we are working with uh, over 4,000 uh, information from 4, 000, over 4,000 companies, um, uh, 200,000 uh, uh, resumes, and uh, 30,000 job postings. So uh, we are to have strong referential material from which we are in pulling these inferences on research. And uh, that's really useful because this is also where we are able to estimate where the biggest supply demand gaps are by comparing the job postings on certain uh, on jobs to uh, related resumes and the, con the work experience of workers that they have reported on their resume. What uh, you have briefly kind of just put the pictures of what these uh, skill gaps look like. And they show the intensity of the skills or these competencies available in the, all the job postings, the related titles compared to the resumes. And what we find is that in for middle skill global trade careers, knowledge of computers and electronics is high and increasing in demand, but it's not being easily met with the supply. This likely has to do with the increasing adoption of softwares and te technical packets that you need for warehouse cracking, as well as accounts management and international um, billing. We also see, as far as skills are concerned, complex problem solving is at the top of the list. And we often hear this from uh, you know, CEOs and from businesses that you know, we, we just can't find workers who have the complex problem solving skills. And this is really relevant because at the pace at which technology is shifting how we do activities in global trade, workers at all levels need to solve new problems in order to keep up with the technical change. And we are seeing this very much in the demand on the job postings and actually the supply that um, we're seeing in the resumes as well. Similarly, abilities in communication and written and oral skills are high in demand, but the supply is not keeping up as yet and technical familiarity with warehouse management software is increasingly in demand, but uh, uh, the supply is not keeping up. And this is likely because the plethora of software that is coming out and technologies that support warehouse management and uh, you need constant upskilling and training for the workers to keep up with it. And finally, that also parallels the need for computer tools that we are seeing in tracking and management 
for global trade. Finally, what I do want to point out is the reason for these gaps and demand likely also have to do with the diversity of activities that comprise global trade. Global trade, uh, very broadly defined, and also how census defines it, is the trade of goods across international borders. And this can happen in the physical commodities as well as in software and services as well. And the software and services we often track with e-commerce. Here, what we found is that e-commerce activities comprise about 7% of all the global trade job postings that we saw. And uh, while that might seem um, relatively small compared to the amount of goods that are being shipped out, these activities actually spread across many different occupations and types of things. So even wholesalers and manufacturers who typically ship their goods are now engaging more and more into e-commerce activity. And this is even more so true now after the pandemic and the push towards online sales that we have experienced. But uh, increasingly, you see global trade is not just um, concentrated in the wholesale sector, but you see it all the way across and includes computer softwares now, as well as uh, information systems management. With that, uh, I would, uh, this brings us to our main research, to the end of our main research findings. And with that, I'd like to show you our uh, global trade dashboard. If, uh, Ray, is the screen sharing fine? Yes. Okay. And let me show you the dashboard. So we created this online tool that would help. Uh, oh, educators. we still need to bring it up. It's not up yet. Sorry. Oh. Well, and 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 while you, while you're bringing that up again, um, the last um, slide you had about e-commerce. When I think about it, you know, these are job postings from the last year, and when you look at seven percent of all those activities centering around e-commerce, that's really a substantial amount of activity towards e-commerce. And I know, you know, our our, our previous speaker. Um, in our World Trade event was talking about some of the dynamics and, and impacts of, of e-commerce. So, so really for me, that 7% is really quite a huge number, so. Absolutely, and it, it's, it's growing. Um, and actually just a background on how did we track e-commerce activity and e-commerce jobs. So here what we did was we used the uh, uh, keywords and key phrases related to point of sale devices, clicks per uh, view, and uh, similar digital marketing and similar uh, uh, key, key phrases that are very common in uh, e-commerce. And that's how we identified not just businesses, but also job postings and resume activities relating to e-commerce. And, and just to tee up a little bit, um, this tool that you developed to look closer at middle skill uh, jobs is a dynamic tool. So actually the, the community colleges will be posting this information, which will allow um, both the institutions, the instructors, um, as well as access to students to be able to look at this information in a real dynamic way. So this is literally uh, a, a cloud driven application that, um, you know, it's not just a report of statistics, but an actual tool. So, uh, excited to show everyone this. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ray. So this uh, tool is an interactive dashboard, as Ray pointed out, and it's linked to actual uh, job postings and resumes at the back end. And uh, we can update the resumes to be as, uh, and the job postings to be as real time as possible. So all this data uh, reflects uh, job postings that are actually, some of which are currently uh, still open. And uh, the way we have structured this and our purpose really was, you know, a lot of our research uh, or generally research that comes out is, is static, right? It, it comes out in a report or a paper and it's not necessarily easily accessible for exploration for different purposes or uh, different users as well. We really wanted to bring this job and career data and information uh, make it accessible to people who need it most, which in which we think would be job seekers and students, but also educators and those designing curriculums for training in, in global trade careers. So we've designed this uh, tool to be very much, uh, you know, a, a run along use cases for students and job seekers, as well as for educators. 
there's a how-to guide that you can always click into and it'll show you uh, additional uh, information on global trade sector, but you can follow any of these pathways as well to identify and explore global trade activity within that region. So for example, if you're an educator and you really want to dig into e-commerce, well, we can follow the e-commerce link. And this is the, the dashboard will now populate with e-commerce uh, competencies, which are the knowledge, skills, abilities, technologies, and tools based on companies that are hiring for e-commerce positions and the various job titles that fall within those categories. You can uh, select an e-commerce occupation uh, as you want, and it will update, uh, the interactive dashboard will update, update all the knowledge, the competencies uh, demanded according to local job postings, present the average hourly pay where available, show how many job postings are actually providing this information and which are the main companies that are hiring uh, for for these positions, you can um, you can always go back to the main page, and just as we have uh, uh, explored e-commerce, physical commodities, he said, the shipping through the local ports is also a was the major portion of global trade activity, and uh, we wanted to really capture okay what type of commodities are we exporting, where are they going. And what are these industries and who are these businesses that are exporting, right? And so we made this uh, nifty little dashboard that shows the trade flows. Uh, you can restrict them by exports only or imports. You see the predominant industries that are uh, shipping in, in these categories. And uh, you see the uh, main employers and the names of main employers who are shipping, as well as the types of commodities that they do. All of these, um, uh, graphics are uh, cross filtering. So for example, you could click on any one of the colors in the graphics and it will filter the remaining commodities and the act activities that are shipping. Now, uh, importantly, I'd like to point out that a lot of the global trade activities is actually driven by um, logistics supply chain uh, organizations and support activities. That's why professional and technical services shows up so high. But uh, there are a lot more things to explore in this, uh, in terms of our competencies and our competency gaps. It's possible to look into any occupation in global trade, but actually there is variation even in um, uh, the competencies for occupation by different industries. So this, sorry, this is uh, loading up, but we can, for example, look for and you search here so we can say freight. We are looking for a freight. That's why I spelled it right. <laughs> and um, it'll populate the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, competencies for freight and cargo inspections. But you can also further drill down on a specific um, industry within that, right? So crop production, um, freight agent is going to have a different set of competencies. Now, as you drill down, you're going to get fewer um, uh, fewer available job postings providing the information. So the information might get a little thinner, but that is an artifact of real-time data based on real job postings that we would expect to see. Well, and this is great because it really gives people interested in the impact of these careers a real insight as to not only the skills and the skills gaps, but what those jobs pay, you know, and and who are the companies. So um, this is really a very different exploration of international trade and careers. And, and again, it really unmasks some of these, uh, you know, soft skills as well as hard skills, as well as technical abilities, because oftentimes it's hard to uh, communicate with students as to the types of tools they would need to use, what kinds of technologies they, they need to be familiar with. So um, it's very dynamic in, in terms of its ability to give you a better picture of what these trade jobs look like. Absolutely. And uh, the other really cool thing that comes along with this is I've mentioned, and you guys saw the 
graphic for this earlier in the slides, but we can look at how people have moved into global trade careers for any different occupation. So we can say, let's try bus drivers even, and we can see bus drivers popularly come from also being bus drivers, couriers and messengers, or light truck drivers. Um, we can look up order clerks, for example, or procurement clerks, which is a uh, a little more higher skilled job and requires some more background expertise. But you see this expertise is actually coming from billing and posting clerks or administrative assistants and purchasing assistants or public well, relations and fundraising managers. Well, and, 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 and what's really important about seeing the data in this way is one of the things we hear from many, many, many employers, both in international trade and other areas, is they have a hard time finding the right candidates. And so oftentimes they have to look to other industries and other disciplines. So this really gives uh, you know, an insight as to where some of those recruits might, might be found you know, through these, these dynamic career path maps. Absolutely. Thank you, Rahid. That's a great point. And so really, uh, Ray had mentioned this about our approach and our algorithms are different. We are not just doing a keyword search. So I want to show uh, one specific component, which is uh, the job content. And we are able to drill down onto any particular job and uh, really look into what that resume or that job posting is comprised of. And if we look across all the global trade, you start to see that these are, this is how our AI uh, sees a job posting or job content, whether it's on a resume or job posting coming through. It parses it out into, this is, uh, it's not grammatically correct language, but it's computer correct language in the sense. Uh, but this, this actually, this detail is a really useful to quickly look into what type of uh, activities are being demanded and how are they being mentioned or spoken of on uh, job postings. And uh, this gives us very unique insight as to what tasks are and how these tasks are changing and how specific they are to the occupation. And uh, this at the back end is really, you, you also see the employers here, but this is the back end is really the magic that's driving uh, how we are able to search across work content, compare resumes to job postings and provide insight on even the soft skills that are usually so hard to measure all in, in real time. And, and this is particularly important, considering that most jobs now are found located job seekers, uh, as well as those looking to hire is done online. So this is especially relevant in, uh, in these times. Absolutely. And this uh, also will help, our, our motivation behind this was also to help in curriculum design. When educators are sitting and putting a curriculum together and aligning it with actual local demand, it's useful to know not just the upper level uh, you know, competencies in terms of complex problem solving or what, we also want to see, well, what exactly is driving this solve problem? Why are they saying that complex problem solving is important? In which context and situations do they need to solve problems and how do they typically address them? So uh, we wanted to, we put this all forth quite uh, with the motivation that we want the data and the analytics to be transparent to the users, to both students, job seekers, as well as educators so that they can make better informed decisions on how to support and grow the global trade economy of the region. Well, and, and again, I, I really want to thank our partners because research like this can't happen without the support of uh, the community colleges, the Port Wainimi, who is very instrumental in helping us data mine to identify uh, the international trade firms, uh, the Economic Development Collaborative, which is dedicated uh, to informing the public. Um, with some of this microeconomic data. So, um, so there was, uh, it was definitely a team effort to bring all this together and, uh, um, you know, very exciting tool. Um, actually, I don't have any memory of a tool like this existing in this fashion where it's actually reading resumes, reading job postings and determining some of the skill sets involved. Thank you, Ray. Well, very good. Well, um, you know, it's great to be able to present this. 
Um, if anyone has any questions about the research that's been done here, um, again, uh, what I think is so important is, um, you know, 45% of US trade flows um, through the West Coast ports. Um, and as a result, there's a huge amount of jobs, literally millions of jobs connected with international trade in California. So it's especially important that we not only understand trade from a policy and supply chain logistics standpoint, but also understand how this industry is creating careers, creating jobs, and, and how we best get the talent to an industry that's so important to the state of California. So um, we appreciate the opportunity to study the subject and uh, look forward to uh, the comments that you may have afterwards. And uh, please feel free to contact us through the EDCVC, the Economic Development Collaborative Ventura County. So thank you everyone. And uh, we look forward to our next presentation, hopefully at World Trade Week, uh, number 10 for the Port of Wainimi. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Ray and Lokesh. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Yes. I have a few questions from the audience for you. So I'd like to uh, start with the first one. Um, has this data collected during COVID, has this data been collected during COVID and are there any impacts that are related to COVID in international trade trade in terms of the firms that you saw the, the, the findings um, through your research? Very impressive presentation, very impressive technology. But how, how do you think COVID impacted the research you did? Thank you. Should I jump in or? Uh, yeah, go, go ahead and jump in. Oh, so great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, this is pretty exciting research and work, and there was so much more that we wanted to show, but fine. So uh, regarding this question, yes, we also did run a survey of small businesses across California. There were about 211 global traders that we found. Uh, in all, we found that uh, global traders had a smaller impact within the first uh, three months of the onset of the pandemic related to all other businesses. However, global traders, we found uh, the impact when they felt it was on the supply chain side and um, uh, somewhat access to credit, which is greater than for other businesses. However, the very interesting finding that we had was global traders tended to be more innovative in their response to uh, the crisis uh, in, in terms of either introducing new products, engaging new customers, or uh, changing how they got their goods and services over to customers as well. Um, yeah. uh, you want to add a long way? Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, we've done several different uh, studies on trade. And one of the themes that, that keeps coming out and, and, and this latest research really shows it is the innovativeness of international trade firms, you know, and, and that continually comes out. And we often don't, you know, give credit where credit's due in terms of the innovativeness in the business models that you have to have if you're conducting international trade, right? And, and, and people in trade sort of intuitively know this, but you've got to be innovative, right? You have to maintain the business model that drives your sales and, and keeps your customers happy, but that has to uh, adapt to uh, different kinds of markets. And that skill of being able to adapt your business model without ruining the very thing that drives value is a, is kind of a hallmark of, of international trade firms. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting in, in, in this COVID research that uh, uh, we had done a COVID survey and, and, and that came out as well. So, so it's just a, a real interesting thing because we, we don't often associate going global as an innovation skill set. And uh, actually, I'd like to add something just a little bit more. Uh, so we did collect a lot of this data on the job postings during COVID. And uh, so they were active as of December 2020. What we did see was there was a rise in uh, remote work applications. However, when we compare them to rest of non-globally trading companies, telework uh, increases about 10 percentage points lower 
than the average other businesses because a lot of occupations in global trade could not, you know, maybe in e-commerce related activities, but otherwise production, you cannot, I mean, you need the people in the room to do the work. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd add that. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add too that it, um, that we we did a, a a another research study along with this that looked at the effects of COVID. Um, so we did these these two studies, uh, two separate studies at once, and we had over twenty one thousand responses from firms. But out of those twenty one thousand uh, responses, we had uh, what's the exact number? I believe it was over two hundred uh, responses from international companies conducting international trade. And uh, it was just real interesting to see, you know, what those trading firms look like and then compare them uh, against firms that at least we, we hadn't identified as doing trade. So I, I don't know if you can give kind of a, a preview of, of just some of the basic findings, Lokesh, of that. Oh, sure. So of, of that, it's, um... So this is a, a COVID impact on the global traders, right? I'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but essentially, they, they fared better overall. Um, so global traders had smaller sales decline on average compared to businesses, to other businesses. However, global traders were more likely to have closed their operations by April 2020, either temporarily or permanently. So if they did feel a sales decline, they were more likely to see a 100% sales decline and, and you know, just pause operations. Uh, some of them came back later on, uh, many didn't. Uh, we also see that the majority of the impact on global traders of the pandemic was through supply chain disruptions and lack of access to credit. And this is relative to other businesses. And finally, global traders were more likely to innovate rather than adjust their way out of the crisis. What this means is innovations are things like they change their product or introduce a brand new product. Uh, adjustments are things like um, uh, accommodated uh, social distancing or, um, or make temporary changes to your production processes to meet demand. Well, and again, that that really speaks to this ability of trading companies to react, you know, and. And again, you know, we often think of innovation as strictly a, a new product, new service, but it's also innovation within the business model. It, it could be your pricing, it could be your supply chain, it could be uh, all kinds of adjustments you make in your business model to make the business more sustainable. So, uh, you know, again, I, I, I think it not only speaks to one of the core things that international trading companies do well, but it also speaks to the core of the California economy, right? We have so many jobs and so many companies conducting global trade that, you know, it, it, uh, it, it provides you with a picture of, you know, one of California's strengths and that's innovation in general. Okay, thank you very much. I have several more questions for you. Uh, this one was asked by our keynote presenter, Marianne Rodin. How can this tool be used to design professional training for specific jobs? Good question. Um, so what's interesting is, so, so this work is based on a lot of different projects and approaches um, uh, that Lokesh and I have done together. But one of the, the technologies that, that Lokesh has developed that, that dovetails with this is uh, he's developed uh, technology that has the ability to upload resumes and analyze those resumes against the information. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that, Lokesh. Yeah, uh, definitely. Thanks, Ray. So um, the tool is, is is quite dynamic, and uh, the AI does most of the work, right? It, it we feed it the resumes and the job postings, and it does the work. So uh, previously, when you're designing curriculum or training, you wanted to talk to employers, get their feedback. Uh, it mattered which employers are there, and and uh, this process could take a long time. You know, having the surveys or even the meetings with employers. You're using the uh, job postings. We are directly able to pull this information in real time. 
and get the competencies that employers are actually looking at advertising for in real time and compare them to resumes that are actively looking for positions as well. So um, what this does is, uh, at, at first it reduces the timeline required to create new curriculum or even identify what type of competencies are, are needed. And uh, the, the one thing that I had uh, shown was the, the report on the job content, right? So usually when we look at um, information for developing curriculum, we go to the ONET from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, ONET provides a rich source of data on occupations. However, uh, that data is collected nationally and provides nationally representative samples, right? So if you are looking at what a uh, cargo or freight agent is doing using ONET, the task descriptions and the activities, the competency, skills, everything you're getting is uh, average across you know, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Texas, pretty much everywhere. Right? But what we are really interested in to develop a curriculum that serves this particular demand is being able to understand the demand that is specific to the region and to employers within that region who are trading globally. And that's what we are able to do. So even within uh, this tool, when we are looking at say, online marketing occupations. We are only looking at the job postings of online marketing uh, uh, positions at companies that are trading globally. We are only looking at, say, even an accountant who is uh, at a position at a company that is trading globally and has activities that have to do with global trade for that accountant. So uh, this tool is giving a much um, more nuanced and rich uh, granular look at what exactly um, uh, employers are demanding for global trade positions in the region. So uh, this is giving a much better picture than what uh, industry standards use in terms of uh, ONET or uh, labor market information that's done at the NAICS level or the occupation level. We are actually seeing this for global trade positions in globally trade uh, trading companies, which is highly specific. And uh, it's, it's the feedback we're getting is that it's actually quite useful in identifying specific skills and even understanding, hey, what technologies or tools should we be upskilling people in, right? Even if it is, should it be Tableau or Power BI? Well, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily be, well, what can the professor teach the easiest, right? It should be rather, well, what are the employers demanding? And uh, this helps bridge that gap um, in, in terms of how this tool can be used. Well, and, and, I, and I think, too, for employers, um, one of the things we consistently hear from uh, all employers across different uh, industries, but particularly international companies, is how do I find my recruits, right? There's sort of the, the, the obvious suspects who are people who have been in the trade industry, but this tool also gives you the ability to see what skills or jobs led up to them getting in uh, to international trade. So, you know, uh, companies are always trying to get the competitive edge. You know, it's a real competitive job market. So this has the potential of informing employers where they're going to find, you know, their, their next candidate, where that farm system is going to come from. And, 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 and this is really valuable in terms of the community colleges, you know, looking at people who want to, you know, transition from one career um, to getting into uh, international trade. So, so there, there's a lot of really cool applications, um, you know, to this type of technology. And, and I think, too, it uncovers, you know, we all know a, a lot of us, you know, especially uh, the older generation of people who came up through trade, th there was very little you know, formal training and trade, right? So we came from all these different disciplines. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to see what some of these soft skills are or what some of these technology areas that lend themselves well to someone who's getting into trade. And I, and I think too, from our research, one of the important findings that we have is there, there's sort of two components to trade. It's not just you know, can you learn the skills of trade? But also we're really finding, and again, it goes back to the innovation story, is that an innovation mindset is the mindset of an international, you know, company going global, right? So there's this, this overarching mindset of innovation along with uh, these particular skills that make someone a good candidate for a, for a global company. 
Okay, great. Thank you. I have a couple of comments that were posted in the question section that I'd like to read for everyone. They were made by Adeline Paulus. Uh, she shared, uh, she's, uh, she says, thank you, Ray and Lukesh, for sharing the project. Um, and she mentions that the report will be available on our regional sccrcolleges.org website, as well as the sector website, which is globaltradeworkforce.com for anyone that would like to access it. Um, and there is a question from the audience. It's uh, from Carlo Gallo. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Could the speakers please clarify how their findings break down according to the size of the business? For example, small to medium enterprises versus larger companies and multinational companies. Thank you. Lokesh, do you want to address that? Oh, yes. So uh, that's that's another really fun feature that we're doing. It, uh, when you look at administrative or statistical data that's uh, coming from the Common Bureau of Labor Statistics or otherwise, you know, you're missing out on a lot of very small and micro businesses. Uh, so both in our survey, so our COVID survey focused on small businesses since we worked with the small business development centers. So uh, of the 211 respondents that we looked at, um, about 35% uh, of them, uh, sorry, uh, oh, 40, 45% of them had less than uh, nine employees and 14% uh, had between 10 to 49, 10 to 50, and then the remaining about 2% were over 50 employees. So uh, these are global traders that are small um, uh, by, by most measures, right? And uh, even, even like very small, because SMEs can go up to 500 and manufacturers tend to be a little larger usually. Um, so we, we are actually looking at innovation even within a, a small niche of global traders that are usually not captured by statistical data or uh, even larger surveys. And uh, also in our workforce analysis and workforce research, since we are looking for global trade activities in job posts, uh, irrespective of the size of the company, we are actually capturing um, a lot more activity by smaller businesses uh, although you know Amazon and AWS will put up a lot, uh, a larger number of job postings because they hire more, we do still capture a lot of small businesses within uh, our job postings if they're looking for higher positions. And it, it gets normalized uh, because we normalize on occupations, so they tend to be more represented. This is another advantage. Usually in curriculum development, um, um, the small businesses do not get a seat at the table. Uh, because they don't have time, resources, many different reasons. But using the approach we have, which is uh, using resumes and job postings, they get an equal seat at the table when it comes to consideration of their needs for their workforce needs for their future. Thanks. Well, well and I, I, I think that's, that's so critical because again, um, I think a unique feature in the US uh, is when, when you look at the mix of small versus large business in most countries, you know, uh, the majority of exports in a lot of countries are done only by the largest. And the U.S. actually has a great representation in terms of small business competing in global markets. So this is especially relevant to the discussion of, of, of the international workforce, um, you know, in the United States, because you know, we had this huge share of small businesses getting into global markets and, and, and what are they looking for? Um, the one thing I, I, I do want to note and um, is that in order for us to uh, investigate uh, international firms, we have to first be able to find them. And I, I, I really want to thank the Port of Wainimi in being a real critical partner in this research because unless you can get to the data that helps you identify those companies and and the way we identified these companies was through bills of lading and uh, you know I, I, I just want to say that the Port of Wainimi and its World Trade Center was really instrumental in us being able to collect this data so you know the technology is only as good as our access to information and uh, and that was a, a, a big source of a boost in our ability to be able to do this kind of work. That's wonderful. I have uh, at least one more question. Uh, this is great presentation and discussion. 
Um, can this technology be applied uh, to resumes of international trade job seekers, and how can it be applied? Absolutely, it, it can. Uh, it, it has. So we. This is also uh, the tool that I showed is also using resumes of uh, workers with global trade experience, and uh, in in the Los Angeles and South Central Coast region. And uh, the way we have uh, used it in this case is we look at the work history, uh, one to identify career movement, but also to identify their competencies and their skills and compare them to the job postings uh, with related uh, job titles. And, and that's how we estimate the supply versus the demand uh, of available skills and competencies by job in, in the tool. And uh, on the tool at any point, you know, you can select a certain uh, occupation and it's going to show you both the supply and demand. Uh, but interestingly, a, another project that we are working on on the side is the ability for uh, students or job seekers to directly upload their resume. And that is going, and then they select an occupation they're interested in and we, we show them their personal skills gap or competency gap and direct them towards uh, education or uh, courses that are available either at the university or uh, nearby. And uh, there, of course, because it's more relevant to uh, student career progression, uh, we don't use the ONET categories or competencies, but we do something more in terms of what is relevant to the student and the upskilling curriculum that they have access to. Well, and, and, and that's a very unique technology. Um, you know, again, the way we've uh, uh, approached, you know, there's, there's a lot of different sort of definitions of what supply and demand is in any in any job field. And what's interesting about the approach we've taken is the the supply of jobs is the job is the job postings, you know, I mean the, the demand. And the supply is those resumes. And we're actually reading those uh, to get a much more uh, a detailed picture. And then as as Lokesh said, we can do it to a particular region, um, which is also very important because, you know, those global jobs are going to look slightly different in, in different markets and we can actually look at it in different ways. And, and, you know, one of my hopes is, is that we can kind of expand on this work. Um, you know, again, the research that we did for this project was sort of a snapshot in time, but it doesn't have to be the, the technology we've developed could you know, could be updated constantly and, and, and be dynamic over time, which uh, gives you not only some really rich data about what the job markets are doing, but it also um, has, has the potential of being some really strong dynamic tools for both employers and job seekers. So, um, so, so we're thrilled at the future of, uh, uh, of this work, you know, and this project. I want to add uh, just one more. So we have a detailed research report that's coming out that uh, Adeline Police just uh, mentioned as well. But one critical distinction since you mentioned resumes is that, uh, so when we were looking at the career entry and how people are moving into middle skill jobs, and we noticed, hey, this is coming from much more diverse jobs background than we typically see, right? And the, the stand, industry standard approach typically has been, well, when we, we're gonna be designing upskilling or training curriculum, so let's look for occupations that are most easily upskilled. So occupations with the most transferable skills. So a lot of places when they define career moves, they're defining career moves based on what's the minimal amount of upskilling do you need to get into that job? Or another way to put it, how much of your skills are transferable into the new job? But that would be in an ideal world for employers, right? Employers are looking out and saying, what are the uh, uh, new uh, job I mean, employees we can get who we need to train the least. But in reality, when individuals make a decision to change their career, it, it happens for all kinds of reasons, their own life constraints, their own preferences, uh, what's regionally specific at one industry is growing, suddenly there's a space sector locally and everybody wants to go for that job. So there's a lot of different things that go into this calculus. And that's what we see in these graphs, that people move in from many different backgrounds. So training curriculum is better aligned with looking at who's actually coming in for the training rather than ideally who we would like coming in for the training, uh, thereby improving the efficacy. 
So this this uh, small shift in perspective in valuing resumes more in terms of where we are driving this information on career pathways uh, actually leads to some invaluable insights on how we can actually build better um, uh, training options for workers. Well, and and you know, and and again, you know, you know, as as Miriam did her presentation about you know, how e-commerce is, is, is driving trade and how, you know, uh, uh, you know, blockchain and all these technologies are driving, you know, more and more companies going global. And as we're seeing this democratization of trade, we need a workforce to support that. And, and so these technologies will go hopefully in the future a long way to helping identify who that workforce is and channeling and, and helping people transition into careers uh, in an area where, you know, as our research showed, these international trading companies, they live longer, they produce more revenue, they hire more people. So um, this is an important segment to drive the workforce in the direction of. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Lokesh and Ray for your presentation. Uh, at this time, we don't have any further questions, so I will turn it back over to Kat, please. Thank you. One final segment for today's program covers achievement awards. Here is Mary Ann Rooney, Vice President of the Oxnard Harbor District, to make some presentations. I'm honored to present this year's World Trade Week Awards. Our first award is to recognize our top auto exporter at the Port of Guanimi. General Motors USA has once again achieved top rank as this year's largest automotive exporter at the Port of Guanini, with over 12,000 automobiles exported. Founded in 1908 in Michigan, General Motors has been an American success story, and we are proud to be part of it. Congratulations. The Port of Guanini Export Achievement Award goes to a valued customer. I'm delighted to present this award to McCain Foods USA, who remain top reefer export shipper through the Port of Wainini. Founded in 1957 by the four McCain brothers, the company continues to operate with family and values as top priority. They also believe that it is essential that they operate sustainably for today, tomorrow, and for generations to come. Providing frozen french fries to 160 countries around the globe, McCain Foods has helped create enjoyable meal times around the world. Congratulations on your award, and thank you to all of the poor customers and partners who make Cargo Move. On behalf of the Port of Wainimi and Oxnard Harbor District, we would like to thank all of our speakers and organizing and webinar presentation teams. Most importantly, we'd like to thank all of our attendees for listening and helping us celebrate World Trade Week. This webinar is now concluded.